Hey, everyone. Thanks for being here. Yeah, it's, um, I've been looking forward to today uh, for a very long time. And Sod's Law has sort of uh, hit us slightly because the last one, we were venue capped to 150 people. And then we had probably 100 extra people that wanted tickets and we couldn't deliver. So we got, or Lewis, scoured the, the planet, well, UK, uh, for a venue that wasn't so uh, anal re regarding the numbers. Um, we found this lovely place. I love the venue. And um, yeah, so we had uh, 360 pop capacity. And then uh, Sod's Law kicked in, and there's only 200 of you. Uh, so, but anyway, it's going to be awesome tonight. Hands up who is staying for the party tonight. Yes. Yes. It's got a big cavernous room that we need to fill here. Um, we've got some uh, awesome fun and games for tonight. And I've got a secret surprise at 9 o'clock. So if you are thinking of, like, sulking off, just stay for about until 9, nine o'clock. Um, I can't wait. So, yeah, so today we have an action-packed day of content. Um, who here is not a realistic trader mentor? I mean, um, member. Who here is not a member? Oh, wow, okay. A lot of um, newbies. Good. So, it's a very fine da um, balancing act with events like this, because we have some people here who've been in the community for Years, some of you even like seven or eight years now. Uh, and then obviously on the other side of the scale, we have people who've never even seen anything. So I have to try and accommodate for people that know nothing, well, relatively speaking, um, when it comes to trading, and then people that have been here forever. Um, so yeah, there will be at least something here for, for everyone. So the order of battle for today is... Um, I wouldn't really pay too much attention to this slide because I was doing these slides up until about 10 minutes ago. So being the, one of the first slides I made, um, that is now largely defunct. Um, so we're just going to have to go with it. And you know me by now. Timings are more of a guide than anything. As long as we get through all of this today, I'm happy. Um, but yeah. And uh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, no. I, I was sorry about my appearance. Um, but I've sort of, over the last couple of months, had a, had a bit of a midlife crisis. <laughs> so I never used to dress like a clown. Um, and uh, it's only literally been the last sort of six months. And the thing is, I've always been an art yob, right? I've never appreciated art. I thought it's for stuffy old people uh, with too much money. And more recently, I've sort of like developed a taste for art, except my taste is very childlike. Um, and instead of having art on the walls, unlike like my esteemed business partner here who, is like, who knows everything about art and he has Banksy's and all that sort of stuff, um, I am the opposite end. And instead of having it on a wall, I prefer to wear my art. So I saw, like, it was, a, it was ingenious. So Elliot, who's a Facebook uh, or marketing guy, he'll be appreciative of this. Facebook, like, knows me. They know to serve me adverts past 10 p.m. and I'll buy anything that they present to me. And there were some lovely... Um, art came up like in canvas. I was like, oh, that's pretty. And it was this. It was like a pastel -y whatever oil thing. I was like, ah, oh, I like that. Clicked it. Within five minutes, an advert popped up with that art piece in a hoodie. So Facebook knew I buy endless amounts of hoodies. I was like, ha, buy. So I thought that was very clever. Um, so yeah, it, it's always worth cultivating Google and, and, and Facebook to your liking. Um, a lot of people think, oh, no, they, they track everything I do. But I love it. So Facebook knows what I want to buy. Um, so I just do what I do on Facebook, and they just serve me adverts. And Google, um, I cultivate my Google um, news feed. So every phone is different. But if I swipe right, it just feeds me stuff that I'm actually interested in. And if you're, and you can, if you're not interested in something, you just tell you you're not interested. And so um, I think a lot of people, they, they look at this sort of tracking and you know try and treat it like, you know, it's, garlic to a vampire, but I think you should embrace it. We're here. Things are only going to get worse. Uh, Google, I think last time they checked, it was something like most, on, on average, the average sort of a intelligent or tech company has at least 10,000 different data points on you. 10,000, which is just obscene. Uh, and I, I recently watched a video um, where there was an intelligence company that has sort of geo, I think it was Huawei or something else. They know where every toilet in your house is and they know how often you go to the toilet, and they can track if there's any health problems with you just by checking where your phone is going. Because they know, on average, a toilet's roughly this high. And yeah, and so uh, I thought that was pretty damn scary. 
So yeah, I do have my location turned off on my phone. Um, but uh, yeah, anywho. So today we're going to uh, talk about some pretty um, somber stuff. And before, I wanna, before we get into that, I want to sort of put a bit of context around everything, because I always maintain the bigger picture. And I know this seems pretty wacky, but I, 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 I'm a big fan of astronomy, and I'm constantly looking at space stuff. And the more I look into this, we are just so insignificant. Our lives mean nothing. Today means absolutely jack shit, um, uh, without trying to you know, <laughs> slit yourself, you know, get, get all suicidal. But it's always worth maintaining the bigger picture. And I love this quote by Tim Urban, for, who's the author of Wait But Why. The stars will die out 120 trillion years from now, followed by 10 to the power of 106 years of just black holes. Condensed, that's like the universe starting with one second of stars and then a billion, 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 billion years of just black holes. That's terrifying. Stars are basically the in immediate after effects of the Big Bang, a one second sizzle of brightness like a firework before settling into eternal darkness. We live in an infinitesimally small fraction of that one bright second. That's insane. Absolutely insane. So, the first session I'm going to talk about is a demographical tsunami. Um, started off, oh no, no I'm, I'm blaming Gen Z, but it's not Gen Z's fault. Uh, Gen Z is simply the effect of what boomers, Gen X, and the millennials have created. Um, so, although this sounds pretty scary, it's, it's not scary, okay? Remember, we mean nothing. <laughs> so, um, there are hey, everyone. Um, there are plenty of chairs at the front, <laughs> um, if you don't mind getting COVID, uh, so, <laughs> from me. No. Oh, and um, fire and safety bollocks. Um, windows and doors along that window. If they don't open, smash them open and run. So, yeah, right. So, let, let's crack on. Now, for those who've been here for a while, you know that I'm a big fan of... Uh, demographics. Demographics can tell you everything uh, and they can forecast everything. So the Harry Dent, um, some people love him, some people hate him, he's an economist, but he, um, he put a bit of time looking into the demographical spending wave and basically you can predict on average what people will buy based on their age and by doing so you can then really predict of how a whole demographic will, will uh, interact with the world over a period of decades. So, and, and the insurance companies and, and actuaries, have, they've got very good data over the last sort of 70 odd years. And, and everything is plus or minus a year, which is just nuts. And obviously it's all about averages. So on average, you spend the most amount of money you'll ever spend in your life on flats and weddings when you're roughly 26 years old. Um, obviously you're now married, you've probably popped out a sprog or two, um, and so you need your first start home. You need to move out of that flat. You want a house. You want a, a garden of some sort. And then over time, your kids are now a lot older. You need more bedrooms, etc. And so you, you tend to trade up a home. And this is a, a bit of a side, side uh, step. Mortgage lenders, they know that statistically people move house every seven or so years. And so when you look at the mortgage repayment curve, it's like this. It's like you don't pay off much and then it starts falling off. And they know that everyone moves within sort of seven to 10 years. So if you're moving at house every seven to 10 years, you're gonna pay that mortgage forever. They know they got you by the balls or the boobs um, forever. Um, so yeah, and on, on average, people trade up because they're getting more kids, the kids are getting older, they need more space, etc., etc. You then spend more money in your life on furniture when you're roughly 46 years old. Why? Your kids are now teenagers. You need a lot more stuff. Uni fees when you're 51. And this, this sort of top of the bell curve here is where you're peak, you, end up, you enter peak earning and peak spending. So peak earning because now you've been in the workforce for a good 20 odd years. You're not that demographic by this point are of powers of position in companies and organizations. And you're also peak spending uh, because you have uh, an older household. And then it's game over from there on. Um, <laughs> so you have a midlife crisis or late life crisis. You buy the most expensive car in your life roughly at the age of 53 because your kids have left school. You no more school fees, no more whatever, unless you're paying for uni fees and stuff. Um, healthcare when you're 60 because your body starts to deteriorate. Humans aren't really supposed to live more than 40 odd years. So we start to degrade. Um, and technology basically just keeps us in, you know, 
uh, degrade at a slower rate than what nature has intended us for. Um, so we then go, right, we're, you know, times are, Times are short, so we go on holidays. We spend a lot of money on holidays when we're 65 years old. And after five years of traveling, we're so pissed off with airports and queues and waiting, you're like, just put me on a boat and booze me up. Um, and so cruise ships are for, the old, are for the old. If you look at any cruise ship, it's full of old people. Um, and then prescription drugs, and, and then you, you can sort of gather what happens. Um, so that's the demographical spending wave. Now, Richard Branson is, is the perfect example of a baby boomer, right? And he has made his riches off following his, his, himself. So he, when he was younger, he started um, music, the, uh, his music uh, uh, label. Um, it, it was at EMI Records. Uh, because back then, he, he was a kid. And then as he grew older, he basically set up a brand new business or an empire based on the things that he liked. So from music and then... And now, guess what? He, he's, he's done you know, travel, air travel, and all that sort of stuff, and he's cruise ships. He owns a huge, a monumental chunk of the NHS, which people don't know, um, and he's getting into nursing homes. Branson, whether he knows it or not, I'm pretty sure he does know it, is just following the baby boomers. Um, and so where are we? So the millennials, as of 2016, we're the biggest demographic on the planet. There's never in human history been so many humans in one demographic. So I am a typical millennial. Um, I'm not a fan of millennials. Millennials are freaking entitled snowflakes with no work ethic. Um, and, but we are the biggest demographic now. So we, oh, I'm 36 right now. So I guess we're, we're making our way up. We're not peak earning, peak spending yet. And this is another reason why I think, obviously, the world is a cluster f mess at the moment. Um, but, you know, give it you know, five to 15 years' time, we're going to have some incredible booming time, not only because of tech, but, you know, when we enter peak uh, earning and spending, it's going to be nuts, combined with all the exponential technologies. It's going to be absolutely amazing. So, um, yeah, demographical spending waves, they're amazing. I love them. But a lot of this always leads to the overpopulation myth. Anyone who's a Marvel fan will probably get this. If you don't, you need to watch Marvel. Uh, <laughs> it's my favorite. So everyone thinks the world is going to you know, explode from the, well, the 7.8 billion people on the planet right now to 50 billion people or 100 billion people. Um, and they, you, know, you look at rat studies or ant studies and go, oh my god, you look at that projection, it's nuts. It's a myth. It's a myth. Um, and when you look at it, and, and it's largely refuted in the science community, there are not many scientists out there these days that you know, say we're going to have 50 billion people on the planet. So here are a few things we, that hopefully that we can agree on. The world is finite. That, that is correct. Um, the, nothing is infinite in this, in this universe well, that we know of, really, other than the universe. We're running out of resources. It depends. It depends what, what resource you're, you're talking about. Um, there's, with most things, it's not a case of running out of stuff. We're running out of economically feasible stuff. So in terms of oil, there's loads of oil left underground. Um, uh, you know, we, we have enough oil to, to last us, really, to the year 2100, et cetera. But the cost of that oil is extortionate. So it's economically mineable oil, which is the issue, not that we're running out. We are running out, um, you know, ha having a carboniferous, carboniferous? Having a carbon-based society is, is not ideal, which is why we do need to move um, to renewables. Now, not enough space for 10 billion people wildly incorrect. I'm going to prove that to you in a second. And not enough resources uh, for 10 billion people. Again, that is all also incorrect. It's uh, capital and resource allocation, which is the issue. There is a mass, mass sort of chasm of or bad management when it comes to resource and, ca uh, and uh, resource allocation. So the, if you were, like, let's say I'm an average person diameter or measure, etc. If you were to basically fit every person on the planet next to each other, so we literally stood there like sardines, how, how much space, and, and we stayed on one plane, so 2D, on, on ground, basically, how much area do you think that would cover? 7.8 billion people. Size of Wales. Size of Wales. Anyone else? Size of London. Size of London. Anyone else? Just two people want to venture? 
Fran the whole of France, cool. Okay, well, the answer surprised me. New York City. Literally, you could fit 7.8 billion people into New York City, which is pretty insane. And that's one level, by the way, all on the ground. No sky risers, nothing. So basically, all of humanity that is alive right now, babies, old people, whatever, can fit in that red dot. That red dot is tiny. So whoever said London, not far off. Um, London could have a lot more people than New York. So it's tiny. So th there's plenty of room for humans. There's plenty of room for 100 billion people, let alone the 7.8. Um, a bit of feedback here. I don't know if it's me or what, but um, anyway. But what about a sensible? Pardon. Um, <laughs> but what about a sensible living space? So here is my old house. I lived in a lovely gated community. It was a lovely house. Um, nice drive. We had a nice garden. And it was about an acre of space. Okay. So here's a little picture. Blanked out my babies. Um, the garden was nice. And in summer, it was pretty cool because sunset would, you know, sort of come this way. And it's like, ah, oh, it, was, it was awesome. So it was a nice, comfy sort of living, you know, an acre of space, really. Wasn't cramped. So I thought about, what about if humans, every human on the planet, had an acre of space? Now, don't forget, every human doesn't need an acre of space because you tend to be in a family. So it could be. So really, if you look at every family having an acre of space, there's oodles of space. So I thought, right, let's look at it from a first principles point of view. What is planet Earth? Planet Earth is 36 billion acres. But what about inhabitable? chunks. And this number came along. 15.77 billion acres of inhabitable living areas. So obviously all the extremities are, you know, in the, in the deserts and the mountains, they're all out, out, of, um, out of the equation. So 15.7 billion. So every human on the planet, every baby <laughs> can have an acre of space to themselves. When you look at it per family, we can have way more. And that's just one dimension, by the way. I'm not even talking about high-rises and cities and going underground. Um, the <clears throat> if you th think about the crust of the planet, it's absolutely fascinating. You can probably tell I'm a big fan of Elon Musk because he's getting into boring uh, stuff, as in boring tunnels underground. But if you were to imagine an orange and had a cling film wrapper above uh, on this orange, that cling film wrapper is like our atmosphere. It's, it's teeny. Really, it's up to sort of about 100 kilometers. That's where the Kármán line edge of space is. And then if you look at the peel, that is not a bad representation of the upper crust. We, we have barely dented the crust. So, so you could have whole cities underground, deep underground, and you would never know, never know about it. So we've got plenty of dimensions to expand into. So space on planet Earth is not an issue for us. Um, so as I said, it's, it's resource allocation. Now, I have done a lot of studying by, uh, of a guy called Dr. Calhoun. Uh, anyone heard of Dr. Calhoun? He is the pioneer of rat and mice studies in terms of demographics. And in the 50s, between the 50s and 70s, he conducted hundreds of experiments with mice. Uh, he, he called them the, the utopian experiments. And he start, basically, he'd create these big enclosures and have utopia. So no predators, unlimited food and water. And he just wanted to see how rats and mice would behave. So I'm not going to play all of it, because uh, this is a long-ish video. Dr. John Calhoun at the National Institute of Health in Washington. The population of the mice doubled every 60 days. This was called the exploit period. The use of resources became unequal. Although each living unit was identical in structure and opportunities, more food and water was consumed in some areas. As the population increased, most mice associated eating and drinking with the presence of others, and crowding developed in certain units. The third period, consisting of 300 days, found the population of mice leveling off. This was called the equilibrium period. Dr. Calhoun noticed that the newer generations of young were inhibited, since most space was already socially defined. At this time, some unusual behavior became noticeable. Violence became prevalent. 
excess males strived for acceptance, were rejected, and withdrew. Huddling together, they would exhibit brief flurries of violence among themselves. The effects of violence became increasingly visible. Certain individuals became targets of repeated attack. These individuals would have badly chewed and scarred tails. Other young mice growing into adulthood exhibited an even different type of behavior. Dr. Calhoun called these individuals the beautiful ones. Their time was devoted solely to grooming, eating, and sleeping. They never involved themselves with others, engaged in sex, nor would they fight. All appeared as a beautiful exhibit of the species, with keen alert eyes and a healthy, well-kept body. These mice, however, could not cope with unusual stimuli. Though they looked inquisitive, they were, in fact, very stupid. <laughs> Dr. Calhoun called the last period the die phase, leading the population into extinction. Although the mouse utopia could house 3,000, the population began to decline at 2,200. In the shift from the equilibrium to the die phase, each animal became less aware of associates, despite all animals being pushed closer together. Dr. Calhoun concluded that the mice could not effectively deal with the repeated contact of so many individuals. The evidence of violence increased to the point where most individuals had had their tails bitten to some degree. Eventually, the entire mouse population perished. Dr. Calhoun's experiment is a the work of so I, I would spend a bit of time looking into all this and I, I found it absolutely fascinating so so don't forget there were hundreds of different utopias that they created uh, but the common outcomes for nearly all of them had the same thing so there was a steady growth period when they when the, the rats were issued to the environment there was cohesion and hierarchies were set um, then there was rapid growth as they all started shagging, um, constant fighting despite plentiful resources, um, and they, they started to clump in space, uh, in spaces, despite there being lots of space. Um, eating then became a sociable thing, so they would literally go to the food centers in groups. Um, it was very human-like. Alphas fought betas, betas uh, um, and outcasts, and betas fought outcasts, and outcasts with, withdrew. Uh, and sometimes, you know, they would get a beating and not even fight back. They would literally just sit there whilst, you know, other rats would just bite them. They, they, they got so accustomed to being beaten up. It was horrible. Um, and then, obviously, we had the, the preening uh, males uh, that only ate, slept, and preened. Uh, and they had no role in society, uh, and they weren't sexual, and any rare sexual uh, activity was with other males. And so this is, this is the formula for population decline. And it's not just in rats and mice, it's with any other animal that I've found it, that has done these studies. You have less sexually active females combined with an increasing amount of preening males. It's not just mice, it's other animals that do this. Plus infant mortality increase equals population devastation. And I thought, I wonder how, how much similarities you know, these experiments are with humans. The thing is, we're, we're slightly, well, not slightly, we're a lot more complex uh, human, uh, humans are compared to any other animal. So then I wanted to find out, you know, what, what does this mean for humanity? What are the uh, differences here? And what I found is that there are seven stages to civilization. Because we have all sorts of different dimensions to us that animals don't. We have advanced language, we have monetary systems, we have war. Um, so, yeah, so humans have seven stages of civilization. So we have the outburst. Now, this is normally when you have a rising power. And it's normally out of the ashes of something far left or far right. You know, things are in turmoil. Something pops up there, like a populist leader of some sort, uh, and they gain power, normally via extreme violence. They then win. <clears throat> so whoever they are, they win their fights, their wars, etc. They now, it's a new country, new civilization, new rules, etc. And once they become the world power, um, 
I'm, t I'm talking about the dominant uh, civilization at, at whatever time. Because they then own everything, they have the dominant military, military out there, they control all the trade routes and, and whatnot, they are the world police, so to speak. Um, it's then the, the, the age of commerce, because everyone wants to trade with them. By this point, they'll, they'll have the world reserve currency. Um, and because of that, that commerce boom, and everyone wanting their world reserve currency, because it's valid and legal, legal tender all over the planet, it then starts a, a stage of affluence. They start to really boom as a society or a civilization. Um, and then, then innovation comes on because once they enter that stage of affluence, education increases. They spend more and more money and, and emphasis on, on the sciences to maintain their military edge. Nearly, what, what I found is you know, tens of thousands of very well-documented human civilization records. Uh, humans are very much driven by war and conflict. And therefore, a lot of our sort of booming and in, in innovation is due to how can we make sure my stick is pokier and longer than your stick, basically. Um, and so that's really the, the driving force for, for intellect. Then we have the, the age of decadence. Now, this is, I found this absolutely fascinating. In nearly every civilization that enters the decadence stage, celebrity chefs become a thing. I'm not joking. Go back to the Romans when they entered you know, their peak of civilization. You had celebrity chefs everywhere. Emperors would you know, pay big money for these celebrity chefs. Um, and yeah, it's nuts. And I look at where we are today and oh my god, we have celebrity chefs everywhere. Um, and then you have the collapse. Now the collapse is normally, because um, by, by this point, and by the way, when I, when I talk about all of this, it's typically a 200-year thing, or a 100 to 250-year sort of play. So it's not in you know, a, a lifespan. It's multiple lifespans. But then the collapse happens. And as this is happening, guess what? As, as the civilization starts to come down, there's another civilization on the way up. Okay? The obvious one right now is the US is definitely on the way down. They have been the global power for really the last sort of 70-odd years. But China is that sleeping beast which people have no idea um, what, what's around the corner. So, so that's the, st um, the stage of civilization. We are literally, we, we're in the collapse phase as we speak. But going back to the, the animal studies of, you know, how does it compare, animal studies compared to humans right now, it was absolutely shocking. Absolutely shocking. So global fertility rates are crashing. Now, this chart is not fertility rates as such. It's um, the amount of live births per women, but globally. And it, since the 1950s, it has been dropping precipitously. There are so many charts of global fertility rates falling. It's, it's scary. Not just in women, it's mainly males. So I then spent a good couple of days researching sperm. Uh, <laughs> I know a lot about sperm now. Um, so like ineffective sperm, I thought it's because you, you just had dud sperms. It's not. Sometimes you can have a, a really high sperm count, but they have a low motor count. So you can have a, a high sperm count which basically can't move. They're little stubs. They can't do anything. So you need strong tails. For, for, you need strong sperm, a healthy sperm with strong tails. Um, so it's the motility count which is actually the, the, the key thing there. So yeah, male fertility is dropping off a cliff. Female fertility is dropping off a cliff. Um, and nothing is, it doesn't, nothing I can see looks like it's going to reverse. Um, so 2020, uh, 2100 is, is, the, is sort of the year, the benchmark, which most of these studies sort of go up to. Uh, and look at these population crashes. China is the most top-heavy demographic on the planet right now. It's just full of old people. Why? Because they're stupid one-child policy. Sorry, two-child policy. Um, and so as a result of literally generations of having that silly policy, it's now full of old people and no young people. So what we're going to see is India, although they're having a bit of a, um, a population collapse as well, they don't have so much, they have more of a, a, a sort of a bottom-based uh, pyramid. So I see huge amounts of immigration from India to China, simply because China will need the workforce. Don't forget, right now, there are 70 million construction laborers in China that are not being paid. 70 million. So I'm looking at Chris. Chris is a builder. You build houses. Oh, and your brother, and Tom. Hey, hey, guys. Um, they build houses, right? There are 70 million of them in China right now not being paid. They're being paid with food stamps. That's basically the whole of the UK being builders. Um, 
And so that workforce is getting older, and yeah, so China will have to start importing people to replace that workforce over the next few decades. Um, but here's the crazy thing, Nigeria is gonna be one hell, well, I wouldn't say a superpower, but a very dominant country over the next 20 years. They're having an absolute booming uh, population. So it's a very young population. So we will see Nigerians everywhere uh, <laughs> over the next uh, sort of 20, 20 30 years. Um, but yeah, again, Japan, another old civilization, um, an old demo, top down demographic. <coughs> now, this is a slide I was really iffy about. I didn't know how to word this. I know statistically there's going to be LGTBQ. I'm not very good at that. Um, and so I've stuck with this, this sentence. There's a large increase in non-procreating humans. Please don't kill me. Um, so, but yeah, I've tried to be as scientific as possible with that. So this, remember with the rats, with the preening males, it's the same with humans. Um, there is a large increase in non-procreating humans. Oh, this is going to be on the news. <laughs> um, <laughs> please don't hate me. Um, so yeah, one in five Gen Z, so that's the, dem the demographic below millennials, one in five Gen Z um, now say they're LGBTQ. Um, it's actually 21%. So um, blah, 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 uh, 21%. Uh, nearly double the number of millennials who do, which is 10.5%. Nearly one in six Gen Z adults identify as bisexual. Um, blah, blah, blah. So here's the, here's the key thing. It's now 7.1% of the population compared to 5.6% a year ago. That's a 26.78% uplift. In 2012, 3.5% <clears throat> of Americans identified as LGBTQ. That's a doubling in 10 years. From a, from a demographic standpoint, which is where I'm coming from, a 100% increase over a 10-year period is, is like that. In demographic terms, a decade is this. So this is a trend which is only going to increase. Now, I'm not even going to bother touching on, on the why or the how, etc. It's going to be a mix of all sorts of stuff. But all I'm looking, I'm just maintaining from a demographic point of view. Uh, women are bearing their first child at a later age. That's not a bad thing. Uh, and, and that's because equality is getting better and women are getting, uh, staying in the workforce for a lot longer. They're getting uh, better jobs, in, et cetera. So that sort of imbalance is getting better. In fact, in some industries, it's gone full kilt the other way. Um, but what this means is because they're having their first child at a later age, it then means uh, at, during the average female lifespan, they're going to, just by pure time, have less babies. So on average, I think that with that one study, they're having it roughly, on average, six years later than, than average. So a lot of women will have just one less child than historically. And here's a lovely chart. Global infant mortality rates is crashing. As in, less babies are dying at a, at, you know, at a young age. And it's, it's a falling off a cliff. And that's because of technology and medicine, etc., etc. But there is a big but. There are still pockets on the planet where um, in, uh, infant mortality rates are still shockingly high. So here are the worst three countries on the planet for infant mortality. Lesotho, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. So there is a nice, uh, no, I wouldn't say a nice upshot of this. The, the, what's happening here is because their infant mortality rates are still shockingly high. I mean, look at the charts. They're still going down, but it's still horrendous, right? So these countries are still having, on average, something like five to six kids per family. This is the reason why Nigeria is going to have such a big population over the next 50 odd years. Because of, because of that infant mortality rate, they're still having huge families. Um, and so when that combines, so the amount, yes, so all, uh, what am I trying to say? They're still having big families. And when that conv combines with increased education and healthcare and technology, that is why Nigeria and some other African countries are going to be booming in population. So this is a good thing. It's good that it's falling, but it's also good that they're all having lots of babies because humans, we, we need more humans, basically. It's not the other way around. And again, children per women uh, is, is on the slow decline in the sort of the developed um, nations, but again, in the least developed nations, that's falling massively, and that's simply due to uh, health. But here's the crazy thing. We are going to become horses. Tech. So if you go back to the 1900s, 98% of the UK population were farmers. 
and 98% of us worked the land. Then what happened? The tractor came along and displaced all of us. So now, 2% of the UK population are farmers. It's gone full kill in basically 100 years. And tech is going to basically displace humans. Basically, any manual labor job will be disintermediated by tech. This is the Tesla robot, by the way. That's what the Tesla robot will look like. Uh, I think Elon said he's made, making it something like 5'3", so most people on the planet could out overpower it if it were to go awry. <laughs> um, it has very weak, small motors, but it's there to, to do menial, um, uh, menial labor type stuff. Please, if you're in this room, do not think for a second that your job is irreplaceable. It isn't. Tech can do anything, literally anything. And so we are going to be displaced in a huge way. Imagine 100 years of tech, tech innovation. What are humans going to be left for? <laughs> no idea. I have no idea. Sorry? Batteries. Oh, enter the matrix. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, uh, well, actually, I don't think the matrix will happen because technologies, there's already technologies out there which produce uh, far more efficient batteries than the human body being a battery. We are a very inefficient electric battery. Um, so I don't think the matrix will happen. I haven't looked into it, and that's why that's the answer I came up with. There's better techs already out there, so bots don't need to enslave us. The risk that we have is that they look at us not from an evil perspective, but you know, just like if you're if humans have, are about to create a motorway down a country, you know, over across a country, we don't hate all of the ant hills and and rabbit warrens that are in the way. Humans just build the freaking motorway, don't we? Yeah, we try and help with nature and whatnot, but ultimately, the ant hill that we're, or ant farm or whatever, we're, we're rolling over, we don't, we don't hate them, it's just they're in the way. Um, what we don't want is robots to think, ah, humans are in the way. So, um, but yeah, um, and here's the thing. Dis what will displaced humans do? Well, we're going to have lack of purpose because our job for most people is our sense of purpose. Who are you? What do you do? Um, uh, you, you tend to s say who you, you know, what do you do for a living? That's, that's what humans generally do. And so we'll see an, a large increase in depression, so go long on pharma stocks. Increase in gaming, meta, VR, go long on those gaming stocks and also the hardware. Um, increase in drug use. So, yeah, pharma, they're going to be milking it for decades to come. Um, now, also, the, it also depends on the, on the demographic. So the type of person that experiences displacement, um, we, we either we go into two um, camps. You have some humans that will basically enter a spiral of depression, and some will actually become more productive and more creative. And unfortunately, it's about the demographics. So when there, there's huge amounts of studies in, uh, in not necessarily Amsterdam, in, in the Netherlands, where they've had uh, UBI, universal basic income, for well over a decade now in some places. And what they found is that the, oh, again, my, I'm really not politically correct, the poorer types of people that had UBI entered a spiral of depression. Uh, they felt displaced, they entered the, you know, the drug spiral of doom, etc. But then the, the wealthier people, uh, I would say upper middle class, they actually became more productive and more creative because they went, oh, I'm going to use this extra money to do something useful instead of alcohol. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure there's a better PC way of putting that, but please don't hate me. Um, ultimately, I don't care. So, <laughs> um, so here's the thing. Po the declining population will mean an eventual house pricing crash, eventually, okay? And when you combine that with uh, construction, 3D printing, etc., I am still very bearish on housing over the next, you know, 30, 40 years, um, especially as more dimensions are being open to us. Uh, as in, we're, we're building upwards and downwards, and we're going into space, and uh, all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, it won't be long until you can print, you know, a thousand square foot house for, you know, uh, under a thousand dollars. They're already printing 600 square foot houses in three hours for three thousand dollars, and that's today in America right now. Um, so, if you just add normal progression of tech, what's it going to be in 20 years' time? They're going to be able to print huge houses for bare, bas basically nothing. So I think land prices will still remain somewhat um, valuable, but the actual price of a house is going to be booted. Um, so yeah. So I want to end this sort of demographic thing with one chart. 
And I think it's probably the most important chart out of all of this. And it will, this chart will now make sense. Here we go. It looks like we're going to sort of plateau at 11 billion people by 2100. So although I've said you know, we're, population decline is actually the thing we need to be worried about, we are still going to have an increase in population, OK? Because things have a long tail effect. So we are 7.8 billion people here, roughly. Um, so yeah, and this is where the media will get confused. I just want to give you a good bullshit detector, ultimately. So w in our lifetime, we will only pretty much see rising population. But the media will blow that up and go, hey, we're going to have 100 billion people. It's massively incorrect. We will plateau around 11, 12 billion. But this is the, the most important line here. This is the annual growth rate of the world. It is plummeting. And there's nothing, from what I can see, um, that's going to reverse that. Absolutely nothing. Um, and actually, what you also find, or what I forgot to say in the seven step stages of civilization, in the decadence phase, hum um, humans have less sex. I don't know why. I still don't understand that. We have less sex, more affluent as a nation we become. So if you look at Japan, it's the prime example. It's one of the oldest civilizations there, uh, Japan and China. Japan is really struggling to get, its in, um, to get its population to have sex. Yet it's like the seediest place on the planet. I mean, you can go to freaking walk down the street and there's a vending machine of soiled underwear. Like, it's just nuts. Um, yeah, it's weird. But yeah, Japan are really struggling to pop out babies. But yeah, remember, the next time we see someone saying, oh, 100 billion people, just remember this, this population decline curve. We are, it, it is in free fall. So for the prosperity of humankind, get shagging, make babies, pop them out. Um, thank you. <laughs>